Father, this morning we praise you because you're worthy of our praise. And we praise you because you brought us through 2014. And Lord, some of us praise you because we saw your power work and miracles happened in our lives. And others of us praise you simply because we made it through. You gave us the strength to endure, to overcome, to, to continue in faith. And Father, we've stepped into a new year. And we simply commit ourselves and all of the time that you give us to you. For all the miracles you're going to work, for all of the lives you're going to change, for all of the power you're going to display, Lord, we praise you in advance. And we ask that you would open our eyes to see your hand, that you would open our ears to hear your word and our hearts to know that we are loved by you. Now as we open your word, we ask that you would speak into our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and find the little letter called Philemon. A little letter called Philemon, uh, this is a a letter that Paul wrote to a friend. And uh, it's difficult to find if um, you don't know where it is. It's right before the book of Hebrews, way back in the end of the New Testament. If uh, you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, then grab one of these pew Bibles. They look just like this one. They're all over the place. Turn to page 1,273, because that's where Philemon is. It's a one-page little book, little letter. Hey, while you're turning there, uh, let me just mention that we have Saturday services. Because it's crowded in here, and uh, and it's just going to get more crowded uh, over the coming weeks, uh, next few months. And so if you've got freedom of schedule and uh, Saturday afternoon or evening works for you, 4.30 and 6 o'clock, Same service exactly, Uh, same children's time, same children's uh, ministries offered, and uh, a lot more selection for seating, Uh, I'll just put it that way, and better parking too. So uh, I'm just going to keep pushing that, keep mentioning that until a few more drift that way. So uh, uh, just throwing it out there, uh, because we're going to show up and do church then anyway, so uh, might as well come and join us then. Hey, uh, while you're uh, finding Philemon... Uh, if you haven't already found it yet, what is it that really refreshes you? Uh, When you're tired, when you're beat down, when you're worn out, when you're emotionally spent, what is it that renews and reinvigorates your soul? Uh, You know, is it that uh, walk on the beach or a cup of coffee? Uh, Is it laying by the pool or taking a nap, reading a book? Or or maybe it's, uh, you know, working out, going for a run or just zooming through the desert. What is it that refreshes your soul? Uh, Take a moment, share with one of your neighbors, uh, what is it that refreshes you? Ready, set, go. What is it? Now, you guys are having a lot of fun doing this, so uh, I get the feeling that there's some plans being made for after church. Uh, It's like, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. Hey, see, for me, it's playing and praying. Uh, I like to play, whether it's golf uh, or whether it's hanging out with friends, uh, just doing stuff that's fun, and and praying, not like on my knees in my closet or, you know, or something like that, but I like to wander and pray and walk and talk out loud. So I, I used to love coming up to church uh, during the weeknights when nobody was here. But uh, now that we're seven days a week, you know, 16, 18 hours a day, it's kind of hard to do that too. But uh, I want you to hear what the Apostle Paul says to his friend Philemon. Uh, we're just going to look at verses 4 through 7 in this one-page letter. And pay attention especially to verse 7. Paul says, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Isn't that cool? 
Paul says to Philemon, the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Because of the way you live your life, you are a, a refresher to the people in your life. Your family, the congregation, the people that you encounter, your life refreshes their hearts. Isn't that cool? Would you like people to say that about you? <laughs> no? Okay, well. You know. <laughs> it's going to be a short sermon then. Uh, See, I don't know about you, but I want people to say that about me. I want that to be something that, that is part of my life where when people talk about you or write letters about you or say things about you, that they're going to go, hey, you know, they were somebody that refreshed the hearts of the saints. So I want to talk this morning about a refreshing life, talk about what it looks like. And I, and I hope that you will set that as a goal for your growth this year in Christ, that you would live a refreshing life. I know you've got goals about losing weight and eating healthier and getting out of debt. Those are all great goals, but a refreshing life trumps them all because it's going to bless the people around you. In fact, it's going to bless everyone that you come in contact with. So uh, I pray that you want to live a refreshing life. Here's what a refreshing life looks like. First of all, a refreshing life expresses love. Expresses love. Uh, Paul says, for I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. From your love. Now, we know love's kind of important because Jesus said it was important. John 13, 34, Jesus said, a new command I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. So you must also love one another. And we, in churches everywhere, we talk about love. Everybody knows love's important. Got, got to love, we need to love more, we need to love each other, we need to love our enemies. We, we talk about love a lot. In, in fact, here at Calvary, it's included in our mission statement, which says Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. So we know we're not going to be effective in leading people to Jesus if we don't love people. But here's the thing, love can't just be words. We can't just tell people, I love you, and leave it at that. Because you've all had someone tell you, hey, love you, and it doesn't really mean much, right? It might just well just be a greeting of hi or bye, or, or they're empty words, they're trite and meaningless. Uh, you know, because people love all kinds of things, and we toss it around, right? You love to eat certain foods. Oh, I love that place. I love that restaurant. I hope you love me more than you love a restaurant. And people love their pets, right? You love your dog, you love your cats, you got it on your bumper of your car, what kind of cat or dog you have, and you love that. And, and, and that's awesome that you're, you know, crazy about your pets. I hope you love me more than you love your pets. I don't expect you to show me more affection than you show your pets, but, <laughs> or treat me as well. But, but honestly, you know, love's got to be more than words. And, and the worst thing you can ever hear, and this is sad, if you grew up in church, you've heard this before, People will say stuff like, well, I love you in Jesus' name. I love you in Jesus' name. That is like the worst thing you can ever hear. Because if somebody tells you, I love you in Jesus' name, the very best it can mean is, I don't really like you, but Jesus said I have to love you anyway. <laughs> now, that's the best it can mean. What it usually means in the church context when somebody says, I love you in Jesus' name, is they're about to be really mean and nasty and rude to you, and they're going to blame it on Jesus. I love you, but... So God didn't tell us that he loved us. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love towards us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated his love towards us. He showed us that he loved us through his activity. And, and, uh, and love has to be more than words, but it also has to be more than religious activity. You know, raising hands and clapping and bowing down and, and worship, uh, attending or tithing or carrying your Bible isn't how God tells us to communicate love. It's not how he communicated love. So what does love look like? If we're going to communicate love, if we're going to express love so that our lives are refreshing, what does that look like? Well, love practices acceptance. Acceptance. Everyone is welcome at Calvary. Everyone, it doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, or how you have failed, you are welcome to join us here. 
And, and, and uh, you might be going, what kind of place would welcome someone like me? Well, a place that's filled with messed up people. That's who. Because that's what this place is. We all know that we failed. We all have been places we shouldn't have been, done things we shouldn't have done. And yet God has accepted us. Isn't that what he's done? He's accepted us. And guess what? God didn't accept you because you're a good person. God didn't accept you because of, all, because of all the great things you've done for him. God accepted you into his family because you asked him to. That's it. Jesus, I believe in you. I confess you as Lord. Okay, now you're my child. Now you're in the family of God. Why? Because you asked. So if you walk through these doors and you want to belong, we're going to welcome you. We're going to accept you and, and because God accepted us. And, and, and if you're seeking him, then you're going to find him. Now, how accepting are you of people who are different from you, that dress different, that value different things, that vote different than you? See, love accepts and love practices grace. Love practices grace. We are forgiven through Jesus' death and resurrection. That's what scripture says. All of our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. So our, our forgiveness is not, again, not dependent on our efforts. It's not dependent on our church attendance. It is dependent solely on the fact that Jesus loved us enough to die for us. And, and so we need the grace of God, not just for the stuff we've done in the past, but we need God's grace for tomorrow too. Because I don't know about you, but I mean, I'm going to try really hard, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to mess up tomorrow. That's reality. We need God's grace for today, for yesterday, and for tomorrow. And we live in God's grace because he loves us. And here's the thing. Love not only lives in the grace received from God, but love gives grace to other people. Because, great love, because we all need grace from other people. So love gives grace. So if you're going to express love, that means you've got to forgive people. And we need to be forgiven by each other. I, I just say right now, I need the grace of God from you. Because if we hang out any length of time, I'm going to offend you. I mean, I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to, you know, hurt your feelings. I'm going to, you know, not show up when you wanted me to show up. Or I'm going to show up when you didn't want me to show up. Uh, I'm going to do something that's going to disappoint or offend you. Because I basically, you know, am a selfish and clueless person. That, that's reality. So I need your grace. And you're going to need grace from other people because we're all selfish and we all can be clueless. So love expresses itself in accepting others and in giving grace. And love is expressed through compassion. You know, Jesus cares for us like a shepherd cares for his flock. And, and scripture tells us to be kind and compassionate toward one another. So the kindness we show communicates love. Not just love for our people. Not just being kind for our people. Lots of churches do that. Lots of churches think there are places that are, oh, we love each other so much, but they only care for their own. You know, Jesus said that if you only do good to people who do good to you, well, even the people who don't know God do that. He's not impressed. No, he went on to say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So that means when we walk out these doors that our, our goal to express love is to be kind toward every person that we meet. Whether they're people from the church, whether people from the community, whether they're people who that you know or people that you're strangers. Whether you do business with them or whether they are providing care for you. And we're just to be kind and compassionate. And through that, we're going to communicate love and we're going to live refreshing lives that care for others. So a refreshing life expresses love. And in a refreshing life exudes joy. Did you catch this? Verse 7 again, For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. If you're going to refresh other people, then you got to exude joy. So here's a, here's a tough question. Do you bring joy to others? Or are you someone who kills the joy that others have? Now, if you're not really sure about that answer, if, and you're daring, and you're willing to give grace, because we just talked about that, ask some people that know you well. Ask them. See, I think one reason many churches and a lot of Christians are not refreshing is because they excel at destroying all forms of joy. 
It's almost like in church we've created these joy-seeking missiles, you know. And we fire them off at people who are having too much fun, and, and we want to blow them up and go, oh, you're just not taking God seriously. And it happens. You, you know, maybe we've encountered those before. Maybe you've been one of those people, you know, where you think that you have the spiritual gift of scowling. <laughs> you know, frown at people because they don't love God as much as you do or something. Or, or maybe they think that vinegar is the fruit of the Spirit. So their face is always sour. That, you know, that person that can find the, the dark cloud out of every silver lining. And they can just point out the, the, the failure that is possible in every moment. Those people that can turn the good news into doom and gloom. Uh, you know, I, I just guess I, I knew some of these people, and, and maybe you've known them too, where when, the only time they ever kind of get a smile on their face is when they're talking about hell. Like... You're all going to hell and you're going to burn. And I'm going to watch it. Honey, get the marshmallows. We got to roast some stuff tonight. Yeah, they're just, it's, it's doom and gloom and everything's bad and everything's negative and everything's dark. And that's not of God. And sometimes we wonder why the unchurched don't go to church until we realize there's a lot of Christians that don't want to go to church either. So hear this. The Bible references joy over 550 times. So if God mentions something 550 times in this book, do you think we ought to pay attention? Yeah, I think so. So I'm going to help you. One of those references is 1 Thessalonians 5.16, and I want you to memorize this verse with me. It's really challenging, and it's really long. It's two words. So even the most memory challenged of us can, can pull it down. It goes like this. Rejoice always. That's it. That's the whole verse right there. Say it with me. Rejoice always. Yeah. So you got that. 1 Thessalonians 5.16. That's the hard part. Okay. So rejoice always. That's, that's what God tells us to do. That's one of those over 550 references to joy in the Bible. So to be refreshing is to be a joy giver. So what does that mean? That means that we need to smile a lot. Some of you need to practice. <laughs> okay, I mean smile a lot. My brother, my oldest brother who, uh, you know, was kind of mean to me growing up. Not sure. Yeah, he stopped. But uh, he, he just tells me still, he goes, you're always grinning like an idiot. <laughs> and I go, you're always frowning like you're angry. I mean, what's the big deal? I'll choose idiot over anger any day. So, uh, you know, laugh, celebrate, giggle, play. Have joy. Parents, if you've got kids at home or grandparents, when you're with your grandkids, would you laugh and play with your children? Just be silly with them. And, and not in some sanitized, spiritually neutered way. Okay, we're going to praise Jesus and laugh a little bit. That's, that's just weird. Okay? I'm talking about just have fun. And... And I realize that some of you may be fun challenged because of the way you were raised and that kind of stuff. If you need some help with the, the whole play aspect, do one of two things. Either volunteer to work with Miss Julie in the children's ministry because they have fun downstairs. And she knows how to have fun. You guys might have noticed that. And she will teach you how to play. And if that doesn't work for you, then you can come and, you know, take some ideas from those of us who are really good at it, too. You can do some stuff, like in the Garrison household. Try this one on. One day, just wake up the whole family and give everybody a can of Silly String. And then just have a war. And I know some of you moms right now are freaking out. You're going, do you know what kind of a mess that would make? Yeah, I do. Repent. Okay? That's why God gave us vacuums. Hey, do you want to have a clean house or do you want to have joy? Sometimes the two are not, you know, compatible. I'm just saying. You know, dads, if you got little girls, I'm just going to tell you this. Go ahead, be a man and play Pretty Pretty Princess with them. Okay? You can wear those, that little crown and the earrings and stuff like that. It's, it's fine. Okay? You will not lose your manhood. In fact, you will grow in the eyes of your daughter and she will laugh. And if she, she has a phone, she'll take pictures and post them on Facebook. It's Okay? It's all right. We see, we need to teach our kids to rejoice always, especially when life doesn't happen the way you want it to. And we all know life is not going to happen the way that we want it to 
And so we need to prepare our kids for that. So we need to, in our own lives, we need to rejoice always, even when life doesn't work out the way we hope. So that our children know that they can rejoice always, even when life doesn't work out the way they hope. You're the one who's going to teach them that. What a great gift to give your kids. Now, I know some of you are thinking, preacher, I hear what you're saying, but the gospel is serious business. And I agree. The gospel is serious good news. It is serious good news. Come on, think about this. This is We have the message that we are forgiven of all of our sins. The blood of Jesus cleanses us of all of our sin. That is awesome. We have good news that we are accepted by God, not because of what we do, but because we ask. And he'll accept anyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We have the good news that heaven is our destination. Even though we don't deserve it, it's where we're going if we belong to Jesus. So, knowing that, we can rejoice. You guys don't really sound convinced on that, do you? (laughs) Knowing that, we can rejoice. Yeah, see? So, refreshing life expresses love. It exudes joy, and it offers encouragement. It offers encouragement. Paul says, for I have derived much joy and comfort from your love. The word comfort can be translated encouragement. Translation I first memorized this in, used that word encouragement. And he says, you know, I've derived much joy and encouragement from your love, brother, because you have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Encouragement. We should be a people of encouragement. We should not be a people of despair. The church must not be a place of discouragement and defeat. And yet how often in places where God Almighty is worshipped and celebrated, do we hear, you can't do that. We won't do that. We're not, nope, nope, we can't, no. Now I understand scripture offers conviction. You know, Ten Commandments, half of them are thou shalt nots. But it also offers us encouragement over and over and over again. And I'm going to guess that, that we need some practice on what it means to offer encouragement. So here's some encouragement. Psalm 139, 14, David prays, I praise you, he's talking to God, I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Isn't that cool? David acknowledges how great God is because God did a good work in him. He says, God, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I praise you for that. David understood that God had made him And he made him wonderful. Now I want you to think about this. You are a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. God loves you and God includes you and God delights in you. When God looks at you, he knows that he made something wonderful. That he made someone that is delightful to him. Yes, I know I'm a scum-sucking pig sinner and I deserve hell. But I am also loved by God so much that he sent Jesus into this world to rescue me from my sin and to make me part of his family. The same applies to you. That means that you and I, in the eyes of God, are priceless. Because God did something to redeem you that you and I would never consider doing. He sacrificed his child to save us. Now, I don't, I'm not going to ask you guys to volunteer, but I'm just going to tell you from my perspective, I love you, but I'm not going to kill one of my kids to save you. I mean, I'll come visit you in the hospital. I'll say nice things at your funeral. I'll do all that kind of stuff that I can to provide you comfort and encouragement, but I'm not sacrificing my child for you. And yet God chose to sacrifice his son, his one and only son, so that you could be forgiven of your sins and included in his family. He, Do you understand how priceless, how valuable you are to the living God? That is incredible. Now, some of you still are struggling with receiving that, so I'm going to help you out a little bit. I want you to turn to someone sitting next to you. I want you to look them in the eye, eye, smile, because we talked about that, and tell them you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, that's like six words, and you guys are still talking. 
Now, what's, uh, what's really cool is, is watching you guys do that, watching the reaction of people, because some people, some of you, you needed to hear that today. For some of you, that was life and breath to your soul, and it was wonderful. And for some of you guys, you know, you, you, that are married, you use that as like a pickup line. <laughs> Baby, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And, and I'm just going to say, guys, if you did that to your wife, amen. All right? God smiles on that. He's excited about that because he wants to bless you with that. See, this is encouragement. You, you should practice it more often. Now, you need more encouragement? How about this? Philippians 4.13. We can do all things through him who gives us strength. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So churches often become castles of can't, right? You can't dance, and you can't drink, and you can't play cards, and you can't go to movies, and you can't have a sense of humor. Do you know what the Bible says I can't do? I want you to think about this. you know what the Bible says that I absolutely can't do? I cannot go to hell. I can't go to hell. Do you know why? Because Jesus purchased me with his blood. Scripture says I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. It says that I am not my own. I have been bought with a price. And therefore, because I belong to Jesus, Jesus said to his followers, hey, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I'm going to come and take you to be with me that where I am, you will always be. That means that it is impossible for me to go to hell. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus, that means you can't go to hell either. doesn't matter how many times people tell you to go there, you can't. <laughs> okay? Just saying. Because your salvation is dependent on Christ, and he guarantees it. So we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. We can be the people of God that he made us to be. We can make a difference in this world. We really can. That means you can experience the life-changing relationship with Jesus. He can set you free from addiction. He can restore your marriage. He can heal that, that broken relationship with your adult children. He can do all those things because he gives you the strength to do it. Now, I know we've all got naysayers bombarding our lives, telling us what we can't do. Uh, that's no different for me than from you. Let me just tell you some of the things that people have told me over the years that we can't do here at Calvary. This is, I love making this list. I could have a whole lot more. But in 1993, we were told, uh, I was told, um, we can't have a second worship service. It'll never work. <laughs> we tried it before. It didn't work. won't work. Now we have five. Hey, did I mention that we have services on Saturday? <laughs> oh, yeah, I did. In 1994, I was told that we can't afford a second staff member here at Calvary. Now, Calvary uh, Baptist Church and Christian Academy employ 34 people. Yeah, that's kind of cool, huh? I love this one. 1998, we were building this building, and I was told, oh, you'll never finish this building. You can't do it. Well, we've been worshiping in it for 15 years, and we're building another one. Yeah? See? I, I love this one. I've heard this through the years over and over and over again. People go, well, you know, you just can't keep growing. You just can't keep, you, you'll run out. Eventually, you'll just plateau, and you'll stop, and you'll, you can't keep growing. And, and here's the thing. As a church, I, I look out the, the side of the, the walls of Calvary, and in this community, there are 35 to 40,000 unchurched people and, and, and God is still in the business of changing people's lives. And so if God is in the business of changing people's lives and there's 35 to 40,000 people who need to experience that power and we are committed and faithful to share with them the good news that God can change their lives, guess what's going to happen? We're going to keep seeing growth. That is absolutely right. So don't tell me we can't. Don't tell me that God can't. We can and you can. That's reality. Proverbs 11.25 says, He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Now I know, you need encouragement. 
The best way to get encouragement is to be an encourager. So I'm going to challenge you to do something. I'm going to challenge you to decide today to be a spiritual cheerleader and not a prophet of doom. Spiritual cheerleader, not a prophet of doom. You know, uh, how does that play out? Well, prophets of doom, uh, there's a lot of them out there. And and a lot of times in churches, uh, they kind of collect prophets of doom. Maybe some of you have dabbled in this. Uh, It's where you look out at the world. You see the evil that's going on in the world. You see the the violence and the murder and the the wars. You see the famine and the disease and the tragedies. And and you just go, look, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. And and it makes you angry and frustrated. And all you talk about is how terrible everything's getting. And you can't wait till Jesus comes. Prophet of doom. Doesn't encourage anybody. You hang out with prophets of doom, what do you feel like? Gloom and doom. That's right. Now, here's the reality. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. I I read the news. But God is still in control, and we win. That's the narrative of Scripture. God is in control, and we win. Nothing changes that because the world's going crazy. So be a spiritual cheerleader. What, is, what do cheerleaders do besides distract the boys? What do cheerleaders actually do? Yeah, they give encouragement. Yeah, and we call it cheering, but the, the cheers are basically, if they're on offense, score, score, you know, come on, go. You know, if you're on defense, come on, you can stop them, hold it, you know, all the fancy cheers. I'm not going to do cheers up here. Uh, but uh, that would be embarrassing. So... Uh, Ready, okay. Uh, the, uh, you know, but they, but they are the ones who are the designated encouragers for the team. And they don't stop. It doesn't matter if the score is 49 to nothing. They're still going, yeah, come on, you can do it. Let's go. And, and, and they don't give up because it's their job to encourage. What if we became the spiritual cheerleaders for the people around us? And you reminded them that God's in control and we win. And you told them not to give up. And you told them they can do it. They can overcome. They can get victory. They can get freedom. And and you kept reminding them and you kept encouraging them to do that. What a difference it would make in their lives. And you might go, hey, look, the scoreboard says we're losing, but we're going to win. Other people think there's no hope, but there's always hope in Christ. If we do that to the people around you that need encouragement... Guess what's going to happen in your life? You're going to get encouraged because the one who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. I want to be somebody who refreshes the hearts of the saints. I hope you choose to be someone who refreshes others as well. Uh, It's a life that expresses love, exudes uh, joy, and offers encouragement. And here's the thing. You can do it. The question is, will you decide to? Will you pray with me? Father, this morning we thank you. That you love us the way that you do. That you have forgiven us. That you have included us in your family. And Lord, we want to honor you with our lives. And so help-